Reading from the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Here is one vignette from those years as it actually occurred. A district party conference was underway in Moscow province. It was presided over by a new secretary of the district party committee, replacing one recently arrested. At the conclusion of the conference, a tribute to Comrade Stalin was called for. Of course, everyone stood up, just as everyone had leaped to his feet during the conference at every mention of his name. The small hall echoed with stormy applause rising to an ovation. For three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, the stormy applause rising to an ovation continued, but palms were getting sore and raised arms were already aching and the older people were panting from exhaustion. It was becoming insufferably silly even to those who really adored Stalin. However, who would dare to be the first to stop? The secretary of the district party committee could have done it. He was standing on the platform and it was he who had just called for the ovation. But he was a newcomer. He had taken the place of a man who'd been arrested. He was afraid. After all, NKVD men were standing in the hall applauding and watching to see who quit first. And in that obscure, small hall, unknown to the leader, the applause went on six, seven, eight minutes. They were done for. Their goose was cooked. They couldn't stop now till they collapsed with heart attacks. At the rear of the hall, which was crowded, they could of course cheat a bit, clap less frequently, less vigorously, not so eagerly. But up there with the presidium, where everyone could see them? The director of the local paper factory, an independent and strong-minded man, stood with the presidium. Aware of all the falsity and all the impossibility of the situation, he still kept on applauding. Nine minutes, ten. In anguish, he watched the secretary of the district party committee, but the latter dared not stop. Insanity to the last man. With make-believe enthusiasm on their faces, looking at each other with faint hope, the district leaders were just going to go on and on applauding till they fell where they stood, till they were carried out of the hall on stretchers. And even then, those who were left would not falter. Then, after eleven minutes, the director of the paper factory assumed a business-like expression and sat down in his seat. And oh, a miracle took place. Where had the universal, uninhibited, indescribable enthusiasm gone? To a man, everyone else stopped dead and sat down. They had been saved. The squirrel had been smart enough to jump off his revolving wheel. That, however, was how they discovered who the independent people were. And that was how they went about eliminating them. That same night, the factory director was arrested. They easily pasted ten years on him on the pretext of something quite different. But after he had signed Form 206, the final document of the interrogation, his interrogator reminded him, Don't ever be the first to stop applauding. Stalin is der strahlende Held. Im Herbst 1944 hält er eine große Rede. Der Applaus bei seinem Auftritt scheint gar nicht mehr zu enden. Echte Begeisterung? Keiner wagt es, als erster mit dem Klatschen aufzuhören. Eine besondere Vorrichtung hilft aus der Verlegenheit.
This is one of the best known uh, Old Testament chapters, I'm sure, particularly when we think of revival, which is one of our, maybe it's our number one theme around here, at least it should be. I just finished a book, Revival God's Way. Because we tried everybody else's way, I thought it might be decent to go back and try God's way. <laughs> We've tried organizing instead of agonizing and superficial instead of the supernatural and the electronic church instead of the electrifying church. It's just about time we had a change. <clears throat> and no man is able to bring that change, only God. You know I'm sure that this is a, a chapter on Elijah. Elijah is in the category of what I think were the greatest men that ever walked the earth, or walked the moon, if you like, in this day. He was a prophet. Prophets are God's emergency men for crisis hours. Let's say this, it's, it's primary, and yet it's true of all of them, the prophets walk alone. Prophets are antagonized by the... Uh, declension and apostasy round about them. They refuse to bow to it, they stand up against it. And I wonder why a preacher says, every Sunday morning I have 4,000 students in my school here all filled with the Holy Ghost and nobody knows they're in town. But they knew when 120 were in town filled with the Holy Ghost. So here's a question you might work out. What's the difference between the baptism of the Spirit in Acts 2 and the baptism of the Spirit today. There's an awful discrepancy. You may have a headache thinking about it, maybe you'll have a heartache before you get through the whole thing. But obviously the church of the New Testament and the church today are two very, very different things. A dove is a unique bird, he only marries once, he or she marry once. If he goes near anything that smells of death, he won't even settle on it, never mind eat. The raven will eat food that's rotten, you see some of them on the roads there, they're a type of raven. Somebody hits an animal and you see a big ugly looking bird scratching, they're all of the eagle and raven family. But the dove will not eat anything dead, anything unclean. It won't even put its little pink feet down on anything. That's a pretty good uh, illustration, you see, because if you're dead in trespasses, if, if there's flesh in you, the Holy Ghost won't come. He may come and give you a nudge now and again, but he won't abide in your heart if there's filth and corruption there. You can weep and cry and make all the confessions you like, but you won't, the Holy Ghost won't come. Elijah the Tishbite said to Ahab, now here is an, a nobody, a man that has no home, he's a, called him a bum today, a tramp, and he stands in the presence of a royal king who can command his death and he isn't nervous about it at all. He says, as the Lord God of Israel live, uh, liveth before whom I stand. I tell you what, if you stand before God, you'll never kneel before men. The man who stood in the presence of a, an eternal holy God will never knee, bow the knee, never compromise. He'll deliver the word God has given to him. And go hide thyself. Now what do you think he did all the time he was in that cave? Do you think he was collecting bugs to see how many, what variety there was there? He's no companionship. Somebody has given me a beautiful set of pictures from my office. Eagles, oh they're gorgeous. I've only ever re seen eagles fly, and they never fly, except on courting trips they fly two together, but normally a fr the great eagle flies alone. It's the king of the air. The lion is the king of the forest, it hunts alone. Except for certain other seasons. And if you haven't learned the lesson, learn it now while you're young. Great men walk alone. Enoch, who did Enoch walk with? God. 
he's not only the only one, but the distinguishing feature about him was he walked constantly with God. And one of the things, it's nice to be in a school, I went to a school once, that you may learn as much under a tree up some, somewhere in the field there with your Bible or listening to God as you listen, as you get sitting, listening to somebody else spoon feed you. You see, just, just studying the Bible will not make you a saint. It has to get in your bloodstream and work down right through you. You can store your head with knowledge and that's good. You may learn Hebrew and Greek, which are fine. But there is no substitute for a personal relationship with God himself. Do you remember that when they appointed the priests in the uh, old ritual of the Old Testament, then God says, separate Aaron and his sons that they may minister unto me. Now I wonder how many of you minister to the Lord today. Not work for him, but work with him. Not just talk to him, but uh, it's a two-way street as we say, he talks back. This man continually hears the voice of God. The word of the Lord came unto me. Read Ezekiel and see how many times he says, the word of the Lord came unto me. Now chapter 18, came to pass after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, Go thy sh show thyself unto Ahab. Notice he had said in that, uh, pardon me, 17th chapter and verse 1, The Lord before whom I, whom I shall stand, there shall be not dew nor rain these years. Come on now, come on. Would you like to wake up in the morning and the Lord said, You get to the White House as quickly as you can and tell the, the president there with all the business he has there's nothing as important as this I have to say to him I've been with God and he's told me that I'm going to turn a key like that I'm going to shut up heaven that there be no right now come on do you love enough, do you love enough do you love America enough to send a bankrupt is it better for a nation to go to hell fat or go to heaven thin you see it's so easy to read this like this isn't it this wonderful little man, he goes up to the king, he says, there's going to be no rain according to my word, not God's word, my word. And he says, here look, I'm going to shut up heaven and there'll be no rain around until uh, I unlock it. You see, God had said in, uh, what, Numbers, in it, Numbers of Deuteronomy 11, if a nation commits transgressions continually, I'll shut up heaven that there'll be no rain. And what Elijah says, look, Lord, nobody else keeps their word, you better keep your word. Why should people believe you if you don't keep your word? Now you can't shut up heaven and have the crops. You can't shut up heaven without your cattle dying. You can't shut up heaven for three years without industry collapsing. But you see, these men love God so much, they hurt when God was hurting. They didn't hurt just because their neighbors were saying, when are we going to get more food and when are prices going to drop? When is the economy going to recover? When is inflation going to drop? How many preachers do you think will go into the pulpit this Sunday and say, listen, America has spent another week hurting God. We've broken his commandments. We're breaking his Sabbaths. We're legalizing abortion. We're legalizing homosexuality. We're on the devil's side. That wouldn't let you be, you wouldn't become the man of the year. Before you got through, most likely the deacons would change you, chase you out of the front door. Okay, let's go to Elijah down in this chapter. What does he do? <clears throat> I want you to notice the people were against him. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, he said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? <laughs> Do you think we've got any preachers around here troubling the devil? Huh? I hear preachers say, do you know what? One preacher's always saying, you know, I preached for Jerry Falwell and I had my dinner at the White House the other week. Do you think Ahab ever invited Elijah to dinner? Huh? If you do, raise your hand. You're crazy. <laughs> Do you think Agrippa ever invited the Apostle Paul to dinner at the royal palace? Did Herod invite John Baptist to dinner or Jesus? 
The very presence of the man of God scared them. Immediately he came in their presence, he diffused something of the Almighty God, the eternal God. And immediately they sensed their own corruption and failure. Do you remember that wonderful story in the Bible where uh, Paul gets on board ship and everybody laughed and said, who's that guy? Who is a preacher? In chains? Yes. Yeah, he's, where's he going? Uh, he just told me he's going to have his head chopped off when he gets off the boat. What? And he's not crying about it? No, no, he says, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do the greatest job I've ever done for my master. And he got on board ship as a passenger and he got off as the pilot. The ship went to pieces, typical of the day in which we're living. Is the world going to end with a bang or a, or a, or a whimper? Is it going to end up in the hands of communism or the hands of capitalism? No, it's going to end up in the hand of preachers. That ship tossing and twirling, the, the sails are ripping and the spars are breaking and the seas are boiling and the people are screaming and everybody's terrified and up comes a little man up from down the cheapest quarters on the boat and he comes up with a big smile and says, what's wrong with you? He says, was it a terrible night? Didn't you think we were going to sink? He said, no, there stood by me this night an angel of God. A what? An angel of God. What cabin does he sleep in? Oh, uh, he's not, he just comes down to visit me. He came in the middle of the night and he says, uh, Paul, give me a hand, old boy. Remember this, this ship's not going to sink and you're going to make it and you're, you're going to be the means of saving everybody on board this ship, not the captain. They threw all the furniture overboard, they threw all the baggage overboard. They threw everything they could overboard to lighten the ship and Paul says, why don't you quit and just let me take charge? It's the same thing here. Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Verse 18, he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, because you forsaken his commandments, and you followed Balaam. Now listen, here's the little guy, here's the king in his beautiful uniform, with all his servants around him, in a house full of antiques, and what in the world have you got? And here's a little rugged man that doesn't even have a penny in his pocket, and he has no home. Should I tell you what the situation was? Poor guy. He, he got nothing but God. Isn't it terrible? I mean, when you have nothing but God, do you remember what the Apostle Paul said? He says, I have nothing and I possess all things. Now the church has everything, including computers. and uh, Instead of saying, I have nothing and possess all things, now we possess all things and have nothing. Isn't it wonderful how many preachers believe the Bible from cover to cover till he comes to the miraculous? Uh, but Christianity that isn't supernatural is superficial. You cannot separate the supernatural from this holy, magnificent God. Verse 20, 36 of 18 again came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham and of Israel and of Isaac, let it be known this day that thou art a God in it. Notice he doesn't pray for his own vindication first. Let it be known this day that there is a God in Israel and that I am thy servant. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord and us and thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Verse 39, and when all the people saw it, they fell. You know, there'll be a lot of falling once the fire of God falls. The fire fell and the people fell. Now you'd think that when this man had seen the fire fall and the people fall and seen the the whole nation cried to God, the Lord, he is God, that he'd feel kind of on top of the world. Verse 42, Ahab went to eat and to drink. Elijah went to the top of Carmel. Well, that's what Carmel people do. They go to eat and drink. Elijah went on the top of the mountain. 
and he cast himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. Now you try that for an hour tonight and see how you get up. Huh? That's contrition, that's humiliation. Why didn't he relax and say, well, you know, uh, I'm the big shot preacher in the nation. I mean, I pray and the f people fell and the rain fell and the whole nation's heart was turned back to God. He said to his servant, go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and he said, there is nothing. And he said, go again seven times. Now here you've got the patience of prayer and you've got the persistence of prayer. I mean, when his servant had been once and said there is nothing, why didn't he say, well, then it's not, not time for God to work. I, miss, I, I got wrong here. He says, go a second time. He went a second. Anything? No. Go a third. Anything? No. Go a fourth. Anything? No. Go a fifth. This may sound foreign to you right now, but maybe when you're on some mission field or in some other location, you'll discover that God doesn't always answer prayer on the button like that to get us out of difficulty and trial. Faith that is going to be trusted is going to be tested. And here is a man who's seen the supernatural, he's seen a whole nation fall down before God, he's seen fire fall from heaven, and yet he persists in his praying, however painful it may be. The next verse 44 says, It came to pass the seventh time, he said, Behold, there ariseth a little trout out of the sea like a man's hand, and he said, Go. Say to Ahab, you know, go tell the king again. I know I'm a thorn in his flesh, but I'm not leaving him alone. I'm not giving up until not just the nation falls, but the king falls. Prepare thy chariot and get thee down. Came to pass in the meanwhile, the heaven was black with clouds, and behold, there was a great rain. So here's the man, he prays and the fire fell, he prays and the people fell, he prays and the rain fell. Wouldn't you like him for a deacon in your church? The hand of the Lord was on Elijah. Remember before it was the word of the Lord. Now the hand of the Lord. And he girded up his lungs and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Mustn't that have been something? The king's been living off the hog. The king has a beautiful chariot. And here's a guy who's only had two meals a day for over three and a half years. And he can now street the big fast horses. If that isn't supernatural life, what is? You know, we've got lots of Ahabs today, but we're pretty short of Elijah's. Maybe you should turn the question now, not round. Not where is the Lord God of Elijah, but where are the Elijah's of God?